Hi everyone, Dr. Bernard here. You might know me as Chubby Emu. This is my second channel, Heme Review, where I go more in depth on topics that aren't otherwise on the main channel. These episodes are also available in audio only podcast format, link in the description below. I post here when I can, sometimes alongside Chubby Emu videos, so if you subscribe, you'll get notifications when I do. In 2019, I discussed a case about a student who ate five day old pasta and his liver completely shut down. Link to that video is in the description below. AJ, the student, was like a lot of American people his age who went to college in his time, accepted a large loan to pay for higher education, that depending on career choice, where they land, who they met along the way or knew beforehand, and elements of luck and hard work, could serve the main purpose of upwards socioeconomic mobility based on scholastic merit, but after the 1990s served as a potential mechanism to indebt someone for their entire life. The association with this machinery might be something completely unknown to people hundreds of years down the line, but what we do know is that pasta is cheap. One can save money on food. That's a heavy driving factor for college students, and some people like to prepare all of their meals for the week in advance so they don't have to think about it. The patient's practices led his friends to joke that one day he would die of food poisoning, except this time it wasn't going to be a joke. When I started to describe the liver failure, I started with hypoglycemia. That tells you a little, probably not a lot. It's a nonspecific description and by itself, it's not enough to know that someone has acute hepatic failure. I spent maybe a whole week writing that part, and the entire video couldn't proceed until I rectified it. It really could have gone several different ways, but starting with low sugar presence in blood, I found was the quickest way to get to the point that I needed to for general audience. Blood sugar, as an idea, is in common language, and it's easier to grasp by a majority of people than encephalopathy. The word itself being intimidating, and the idea of international normalized ratio. There's an overhead that's associated with going that route that'll make the video longer. What's INR, or prothrombin time? What's hepatic encephalopathy? Why does it happen? How does it happen? How about liver enzymes? What's an enzyme? That's the overhead. It's all technical. Okay, so in context of liver failure, in the very beginning of the case, I tell you some really big details. AJ is a 20-year-old man presenting to the emergency room with abdominal pain nausea, and diffuse bleeding. Paramedics were scrambling because he kept vomiting in the ambulance until he fell unconscious. Abdominal pain with extreme nausea, vomiting, something abdominal, falling unconscious, something neurological, diffuse bleeding. He didn't just get a cut somewhere, it's diffuse, so he's bleeding in many different places. Why would he be bleeding like that? This is someone who also has jaundice. First two sentences of the video tells you a lot. This is not a borderline case, it's an extreme one. Neuro exam, unconscious, unarousable, unresponsive to pain. Diffuse bleeding, so something systemic, something is wrong. Airway is fine, breathing is okay, circulation all right, heart rate and rhythm normal. In that first sentence, I also tell you that he's a 20 year old man who is described as a student in the title. 20 is a little too old to be in high school, so this is someone at the university, undergraduate level. What can you tell me about health problems in 20 year old men? 20s, pretty young to have chronic diseases that are common in people over 65 years old. If we're looking at heart attacks, a 20 year old having a heart attack is more often than not going to have one for a different reason than a 70 year old. Liver damage usually takes a long time to happen, so liver failure happening between the two age groups is likely going to be for very different reasons. And this is acute liver failure, high AST, ALT in the blood, neurologic signs and symptoms, jaundice, hypoglycemia, no known prior liver disease. So what would be a cause of liver failure in a previously healthy 20 year old man? I could go into all the things like autoimmune hepatitis or ischemic hepatopathy or scorpion sting, right in the middle of winter outside of Baltimore. Everything put together, this is very likely something happening due to this person ingesting and putting something in their body. What are some things that a 20 year old might ingest? Okay, heart rate and rhythm are normal, so it doesn't look like there's stimulant use. He's breathing normally, so probably not opioids because that would be respiratory depression. So what else would you think of? Did he drink something? Maybe. That could be likely given age and social demographic being in college setting. If it was to the point of causing acute liver failure, you might be able to smell it off of his breath if it happened recently enough. But in this case, we know he didn't drink any liquor. Did he eat something? Now we're talking. 
One thing that I find interesting in looking at tweets that come up randomly about this case and the associated ones is that this case is often met with a lot of fear. It's something that's taught in medical pharmacy and nursing schools. Because of its nature, students tend to remember that reheating pasta in rice is dangerous. Unfortunate that that ends up being the takeaway because that's not what this case is about. Very generally, reheating pasta and rice after a day or two or three, and it's been refrigerated the whole time within a couple of hours after it was made, is not going to cause problems. So with that, how would sketchy five-day-old pasta that was left out for at least a whole day cause liver failure so severe that the person eating it will die from it? I said this line in the Chubby Emu video. You see, the liver is a highly metabolic organ. You can't live for very long without one. Everything that enters your mouth ends up in the liver as it breaks down chemicals and red blood cells, secretes bile for digestion, makes blood clotting factors that stop you from bleeding, and processes proteins among other functions. And it maintains blood sugar levels, bringing us back to metabolism. When you think of something being metabolically active, you think of metabolism, of heat, of movement, the breaking and creation of chemical bonds involving a lot of energy being produced and consumed. An energy factory could be called a powerhouse. And because we know that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, now we're talking. A sample of the patient's liver revealed microvesicular steatosis, Micro meaning small, vesicle referring to a sac or a vacuole, a space, and steat referring to fats or lipids, and osis meaning a disorder of, a disorder of fat contained in small sacs. This is different from macrovesicular steatosis, where the sacs are big, and they're so big that the nucleus of the cell gets pushed off to the side. You can see that underneath a microscope. Macrovesicular steatosis is common and associated with alcohol misuse, diabetes, and obesity. Microvesicular is not as common. So we're talking about the liver. The liver needs a lot of energy to function. This patient had liver failure. Cells use fats as an energy source, but in these samples we see an inappropriate presence of fat in the liver. From this information, we can take one guess, that fats entered the liver cells like how they normally do, but something happened so that those cells couldn't process and handle the fats, causing them to quickly build up. Without being able to produce energy from fats, some machinery in the cell was disturbed and couldn't make up for this loss, resulting in the big picture result of the liver shutting down. In the extreme case that 100% of the liver no longer functions, wastes in the blood that are normally processed by the liver accumulate quickly. Among them is ammonia from gut bacteria processing proteins, and this causes disturbances in cerebral osmolites. This results in more water entering the brain than is normal, causing cerebral edema, intracranial hypertension, herniation, and then it's over. So what was that something that happened so that cells couldn't process and handle the fats? Well, it was bacteria that grew on the five-day-old pasta, but it was Bacillus cereus, which is commonly found in soil. If it causes an illness from food, it's usually self-limiting. So it's more than just the bacteria. Some strains can produce a toxin that specifically targets the mitochondria, preventing the mitochondria from using fats to create energy, causing the buildup and causing the acute liver failure. In the mitochondria, we have ATP production, a majority of it being the product of the electron transport chain where protons re-enter the matrix by traveling through a pore in ATP synthase, and the energy released in that process is used to make ATP. For reference, the matrix is the innermost part of the mitochondria. The intermembrane space is inside the mitochondria, but outside the matrix. Going upstream the process, if ATP production ends with protons re-entering the matrix because a gradient was created, then something must have caused them to be pushed out of the matrix and into the intermembrane space. If protons were moved, and those are positive charges, then we could make a guess that electrons, which are negative charges, were involved. And we know in the process of ATP production, there's the electron transport chain. Four complexes, big proteins, starting with nicotinamide, adenine dinucleotide, NADH, the reduced form, and it gets oxidized. So two electrons are removed and transferred to a compound called ubiquinone. The quinone moiety 
is a conjugated cyclic dione, so there's two carbon double bond O's in a structure with delocalized electrons. Gaining two electrons means that the charge becomes negative, so to neutralize it, two protons are accepted and ubiquinone becomes ubiquinol, and then it diffuses across the membrane. In the United States, you see commercials everywhere on TV for CoQ10 supplement, and that is ubiquinol. As this conversion happens, the electron current passing through complex one powers the active transport. So remember, it's creating a gradient of four protons in the intermembrane space. But where does NADH come from? Going upstream the process, we have the tricarboxylic acid TCA cycle, which reduces NAD to NADH. This is all the stuff that you learned in school multiple times, and depending on where you end up, may or may not have applied to you. You have had to memorize it multiple times for a test without any context of why, but really, all of those times that you learned it were for situations like this, where it absolutely applies here, and it's good that you know about it, even if you don't remember it all from school. To enter the TCA cycle, you need acetyl-CoA. Where does acetyl-CoA come from? There's one pathway where it comes from glucose, but there's another pathway where it comes from fats. And remember, we know that there's a dysfunction of creating ATP, and the pathological findings show an inappropriate accumulation of fats in the form of microvesicular steatosis. So this brings us to how the toxin from the bacteria in five-day-old pasta caused fulminant hepatic failure. To get acetyl-CoA from fatty acids, the pathway is going to appear boring, but there's important steps in between that entire diseases are based off of. Triglycerides and fatty acids get converted to acyl-CoA by acyl-CoA synthetase. Acyl is a general term describing a double bond oxygen and carbon and an alkyl group, so the number of carbons is not specific. It could be a couple, it could be a lot. In any given sample, you're going to have a wide variety of different quantities. Really long fatty acids, which have a lot of carbons, can't cross the mitochondrial membrane on their own, but there's a shuttle for it mediated by carnitine. Diseases can happen here if there's something wrong with the carnitine transporter, a problem with the carnitine palmitoyl transferase enzyme that places the carnitine on the fatty acid in or outside the mitochondria. These are all diseases of metabolism. So you can expect highly metabolic tissue like the liver, the heart, the brain to be affected in patients who have it. Carnitine is bound to the fatty acid and shuttled into the mitochondria where the carnitine is then taken off and acyl-CoA is reformed again. And this is where it's converted to acetyl-CoA through beta-oxidation, completing our cycle. But if we're looking at a problem where fat is building up into vesicles, and we're assuming that the person didn't have any deficiencies upstream of the cycle at this point, then it's here where the problems can form, and this is called fatty acid beta-oxidation. Beta, referring to the second carbon from the carbonyl group, or carbon number three if you're counting carbons starting from the carbonyl. In that first step, there's three isozymes, very long-chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase, medium-chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase, and short-chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. You can be born with deficiencies of these enzymes, and it's not that uncommon. Medium-chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency has a prevalence of 1 in 20,000 live births. So what happens if someone has a deficiency for medium-chain? They would have primary inhibition of fatty acid beta-oxidation. What does that look like? Let's say it's a kid, and he's a really picky eater. Mom's not having any of it. She says, you know what? If you don't want to eat this dinner, I'm not cooking anything extra, and I'm not going to buy you McDonald's chicken nuggets. Guess you're just going to have to wait until morning to eat. So the kid's liver will start tapping glycogen stores to provide glucose to make acetyl-CoA to feed into the cell machinery to produce ATP. But as the hours pass, those sugar stores are getting more and more depleted, and it's harder to get a quick source. Acetyl-CoA provides the acetyl group for ketones, and those can be used for energy, but acetyl-CoA is the precursor. The medium-chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency, which is putting a hard limit on acetyl-CoA production, that limits ATP production, causing a metabolic acidosis. Hypoglycemia is happening because the kid hasn't eaten, but also can't use his fat stores. Because of this inhibition of fatty acid oxidation, cytoplasmic fatty acids are converted to triglycerides, which accumulate and produces microvesicular steatosis in the liver, bringing us back to the student who ate five-day-old pasta. 
The toxin made by that strain of bacteria is called cereulide. Again, uncommon strain that develops from the right conditions on rice and pasta. Cereulide, from what we understand, is a potassium ionophore. It's a cyclic peptide that binds to the mitochondrial inner membrane and allows potassium to flow freely into the matrix. On the mitochondrial inner membrane, there is a hydrogen-potassium exchanger that is to pump potassium out of the matrix and bring hydrogen into the matrix. But there's two problems with that. As an ionophore, the amount of potassium let in would overwhelm this exchanger. And not only that, remember the electron transport chain happens here. The electron transport chain pumps hydrogen out so that it can flow through a pore in ATP synthase to make ATP. So importing hydrogen into the matrix because you need to get rid of excess potassium would mean that you're disturbing the gradient that's being created by the electron transport chain. The introduction of a lot more potassium than normal into the matrix starts to raise the pH of the matrix because protons are getting pumped out while potassium flows in. Remember, the electron transport chain happens because of proteins, which are adapted to certain pH. If this changes, then you could guess that the complex's ability to function would change because proteins can change in different pH. And there's also some evidence that ubiquinone would also stabilize, which would then not move electrons, impairing ATP synthesis. As more and more potassium floods into the hepatocyte mitochondria, oxidative phosphorylation becomes uncoupled. Reactive oxidative species form because oxygen is supposed to be the final electron acceptor, but it can't do that anymore. The mitochondria swell up and rupture, causing hepatocellular necrosis. Extensive necrosis results in functional liver failure before the cell lysis blebs form in the cell membrane and enzymes start leaking out. As the blebs coalesce, the cell dies and leaks out all its contents. As the liver fails, it doesn't produce the right amount of blood clotting factors, which can result in diffuse bleeding. The liver doesn't process the ammonia that's produced by the gut, breaking down the proteins. As the ammonia flows into the liver from the portal circulation, it's supposed to be detoxified to glutamine and urea by the urea cycle, which happens to be another branch of the acetyl-CoA breakdown pathway. But the liver is failing and the processes are all overloaded and normal function is not attained. Ammonia spills into the blood and flows to the brain where glutamine synthetase in the astrocytes convert ammonia with glutamate into glutamine, which is a cerebral osmolite causing cerebral edema. And without a liver transplant in time, nothing can be done enough and in time to prevent what will happen because at autopsy, the bacteria from the patient's intestinal contents, his liver, and also residue from the pan used to reheat his pasta were cultured and it was found to be Bacillus cereus. The final note that I want to add here is that in the Chubby Emu video at the time, I added in that the patient drank a whole bottle of Pepto-Bismol to the case because I wanted to teach briefly about salicylates. Pepto-Bismol is bismuth subsalicylate, being an uncoupler of oxidative phosphorylation in the setting of overdose. It appears that it could lead to microvesicular steatosis because it consumes CoA, which would then mean that acetyl-CoA would have trouble being produced, so there would be a decreased fatty acid activation from low CoA levels, leading to decreased beta oxidation. Adding in that dual blockade, in my mind, was that there would be no question that the liver failure was complete from a dual blockade of the same pathway. Unfortunately, I could see many comments couldn't deal with that. They would go so far as to say that it was only the bottle of Pepto-Bismol that caused that liver failure, that the pasta meant absolutely nothing. But that reveals to me that those people commenting entirely missed everything about cereulide, about a massive intramitochondrial shift of potassium from a cyclic peptide acting as an ionophore, causing mitochondrial dysfunction. It didn't help that the news articles covering the story at the time just said that it was food poisoning without explaining that a special strain of bacteria that's common produced a toxin that made this food poisoning so much worse than normal. It taught me a lesson that two ideas at the same time that are interwoven and related sometimes won't be processed. My videos since 2019 have reflected that lesson learned, but the reality is in medicine, there's a lot of ifs and there's a lot of unknowns that are time sensitive at that particular point in time. The big bucks are made because things more often than not are borderline and you have to make a decision on which way to go based on what you know at that point in time. 
Not very many things are so obviously unipolar and in just one dimension, but that's a quick review of microvesicular steatosis and fulminant hepatic failure that occurred because of someone who ate five-day-old pasta by accident.